Do not buy The Last of Us Remake. Here it is, side by side, and for the most part, with the exception of some better textures, some lighting, and very light remodeling, it's the same game visually. And they're asking $70 for it in the middle of a recession. I can barely afford gas, and now I've got to pay full price for a game that came out almost 10 years ago? But what's wrong with all of this runs much deeper than just palming off a graphical upgrade as a total remaster? the much-touted rebuilt from the ground up for PS5, of one of the greatest games ever made. PS5 has so few games, by the way, it's getting kind of sad that the best thing to play on PS5 is PS4. So what's the problem here, exactly? Well, there are demons that need to be exercised from this franchise, and it all leads back to part two. I have three super long rants about part two if you care to get my at length take on that game, but after playing part one again, I realized something that I never had before, both about this game and art in general. Good art tells you something about yourself that you didn't realize. That's what makes it transcendent. And that's why north of 50 million people have played part one. For a perspective, that's more than half the number of people who vote for president on any given year. There is something very important about part one. And part two isn't just bad on a technical level. It not only joins the clunky, awkward, and hackneyed writing of Game of Thrones season eight, the modern Star Wars films, and She-Hulk, but it destroys part one. Imagine a stained glass window in a thousand year old cathedral. Now imagine a brick flying through it. That brick is part two. Joel's heroic journey contains an essential lesson of life. You have to fight not only to survive, but to resurrect your own lost humanity. It's about our responsibility to act out what is meaningful in life. It's about life itself and preserving it. The game from start to finish is utterly sublime and nothing, nothing, has ever come close to the transcendent nature of part one. But all it took was a golf club and an impossibly muscular woman to wipe all of that away. If part one is heaven, then part two is surely hell. It seemed very much a game for our times with the boa constrictor of nihilism, fatalism, and political fanaticism gripping tighter and tighter around us. I don't know if you've noticed this, but you can't trust what you hear on TV or what you read in newspapers anymore. In fact, I wonder if you ever could have done those things to begin with. We now regularly expect riots to consume major cities over any given issue, and social media isn't much more than an open-air prison where anything you say can and will be used against you, should it contradict the prevailing orthodoxy. Those in power seem to waver between total stupidity and dark designs for the human race. There's serious talk of people freezing to death this winter because we must curb our energy consumption for the good of the planet. Incompetence is gaslighted as noble caretaking and division is sold as unity. Oh, and there's still no baby formula on the shelves. If that was what part two was really about, I'd give Neil Druckmann credit for nailing the vibe of 2020 and beyond, but of course that isn't really the case. Judging by the utter failure that is part two, we now have some important information on how we can look back at part one. It's clear that what is good about part one has more to do with Bruce Straley than Druckmann. Druckmann was, most likely, just along for the ride. There's no other explanation I can think of for the massive discrepancy between the two games. How could you go from making one of the best games ever made to making one of the worst? Short of having a stroke, there's only one explanation I can think of. Neil was just a hitchhiker on part one. Just in the right place at the right time and got the credit. So I would posit that not only is part two bad, but it is dangerously bad. As bad as advice from somebody you would never trust. Do you take stock advice from a drug addict you met on the street? It's not that different. Now, this is something I fell short of when I first reviewed the game two years ago. You need to understand what embracing the messages of part two actually means. It's good to indulge your darkest desires and you won't pay for it. Confusion 
is actually certainty. And revenge is better than love. Try living your actual life according to these ideas and see what happens to you. You will warp reality very badly if you start to think like this. The people who praise Part 2 are vastly mistaken about its supposed masterpiece status and either can't properly articulate art or are actually as fatalistic and nihilistic as Part 2. You'll notice anyone who defends the game falls back on the same argument that you just didn't get it. They either don't understand art or understand themselves. Uh, both positions are <laughs> equally unenviable. The world relies on artists to supply the greater meaning to life beyond what we each strive for in our personal lives. The super meaning that unites all things was once the province of religion, but the notion of a godless technocratic utopia dawning in our modern age has slipped away into the night, leaving us with leaders who believe with all their soul that they must burn down the village in order to save it. I want to bring in two clips from a YouTuber I like from a recent video he did on art that I think is really relevant here. Real things, true things, have a solid yet subtle flavor. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it, when you live inside of it. You know it when you touch something that isn't crumbling away beneath your grasp. A friend who will never betray you, a belief that you can always hold as true, a family that will follow you until the end. All these things are basic, all of these things are real, and most importantly, all of these things are forward-looking. On the nose political platitudes don't sound noble in verse, and saccharine moral plays don't look picturesque in tableau. And every time one of these simulacrum is wheeled out in front of a discerning audience, it appears transparently hollow in comparison to that which came before. I suppose it's an open question the degree to which progressives themselves are aware of this hollowness in their worldview. I am sure the mileage varies, but in most, there is a dawning realization that their creed is a dead letter, and nothing hastens this revelation faster than an exposure to art. Whatever validity there is in the study of physiognomy, a deep truth remains that ascetics often reveals what ordinary discourse obscures and the lackluster state of leftist culture in the early 21st century provides an ominous portent. It's hard to discern from the filter bubble of the online right, but my real-world observations bear this out. Even among dyed-in-the-wool progressives, no one thinks the movies are as good as they used to be. No one thinks the music is as meaningful. No one can remember the last time they picked up a new book that really challenged their view of the world. And no one, not even progressives, looks at the soulless, cow arts animations, the flat, allegria style corporate art, and the unsubtle primary color political messaging on display everywhere and thinks they are living through a cultural golden age. No one sees the same bland, inclusive motifs and tired, woke platitudes repeat over and over again without feeling their spirit drain away. And slowly, the many resist this conclusion, all suspect that this emptiness traces its origin back to the falseness of the progressive religion itself. He goes on to say that we need a reset, a reassertion of core values like truth, beauty, and the transcendent. The Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote, I am acting on behalf of later generations. I am writing down a few things that may be of use to them. I am committing to write some helpful recommendations, which might be compared to the formula of successful medications, the effectiveness of which I have experienced in the case of my own sores, which may not have been completely cured, but have at least ceased to spread. I am pointing out to others the right path, which I have recognized only late in life, when I am worn out with my wanderings. This is why the damage part two has done has to be properly identified and with any luck, ameliorated. Just look at how divided the community is. Though the sales numbers prove that there are far more of us who rejected part two than embraced it, you can't even discuss this franchise anymore without there being bitter acrimony. Harmony has given way to chaos and where there once was understanding and appreciation, there's now only disagreement and hatred. And there doesn't seem to be an easy way out. There's no detaching part one from two, despite them trying to essentially do that with this remake in order to cash in on 
all of those good and right feelings we had about the first game, the two are now like good and evil conjoined twins. I suppose the best we can make of this is looking at it as a yin and yang type of situation, though that's far from what Druckmann intended with part two. Part two for him was an act of revenge. Against gamers, he found bigoted and sexist, but really at the core of it, it's the insecurity of a man who long praised for part one while knowing he was actually just an imposter, bursting forth in an act of creative destruction. And now they're coming back to the original fans, hat in hand, to try and get the money they need to keep their studio afloat after part two missed the mark so badly in sales. Why else would this be priced so high? But I don't want to end this talk on a down note. Hope, after all, springs eternal. There is an answer to nihilism, and it's something like, when you're going through hell, keep going. Though a great franchise has fallen, and much of what part one achieved is now undone, laying in broken pieces at our feet, but re-glued here in a graphical upgrade uh, priced at an exorbitant expense, we can still process this whole saga with an aim towards the higher good. To those who might say, why are you taking this so seriously, it's just a video game, you're somewhat missing the point. The real issue here is meaning. And any loss of a good and true source of meaning must be properly grieved. And with that, I say we carry on and try to create art that counters those nihilistic forces that would drain us of hope and meaning. Part two is not what I think any sane, emotionally stable person with a basic understanding of art wanted or needed. But things are the way they are, and there's no going back, only forward. I'm reminded of the end of King Lear, Lear, his kingdom destroyed, his family destroyed, his grief literally killing him. The survivors say this, The weight of this sad time we must obey. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. The oldest hath borne most. We that are young shall never see so much, nor live so long. What it means is that despite a lack of confidence in the future, in the wake of such tragedy, we can't rightly expect much, but at least our time left is short. Far be it for me to editorialize Shakespeare, but if order and right can be restored, then the new can come to be, and beauty and truth may yet live again. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this talk, uh, please consider liking and subscribing and commenting. Um, those things will all be a really big help and will encourage me to make more videos. Until next time, game on.